I want to speak to you today about the power and the purpose of meeting together. And I've heard a lot of people say, hey man, when is the church going back to normal? And I think, no, that's not the best way to say it. We don't go back to anything, we go forward to something. But if we are going forward to something, we're going forward to vintage, to vintage. And, and my title today is Vintage Church. The word vintage means something from the past of high quality, something that represents the best of its kind. 2,000 years ago, Jesus said, I will build my church. And he's been good on his promise. By the end of the New Testament, if you count how many churches there are, there's 33 churches mentioned in the New Testament. Now there's 3.8 million churches on the face of the earth. He's been good on his promise. We drink vintage wine, drive vintage cars, wear vintage designs. The vintage church has been around a long time, but God designed it to be relevant to every generation. You see, gospel communities will never go out of fashion. Don't, don't get me wrong. We, we, we want to be contemporary too. I mean, we want to keep up with the times. We live in the 21st century like everyone else. We want to speak to current issues. Uh, you know, artillery coffee, the latest sounds, even skinny jeans and preachers, that, that can't hurt. But a vintage church, a church rooted in the ancient faith is the goal. You see, we have a contemporary face but we have an ancient, timeless, vintage faith. Yeah. And what every church should be trying to do is do the vintage church that Jesus got going 2,000 years ago, which is why we keep going back to the New Testament. So let's do that now. Acts chapter 20, verse 6. I'm going to read it to you. But before that, the year is AD 58. The gospel has been spreading into the Roman Empire. And Paul and his team are returning to Israel from Europe. And uh, Paul is in a rush to get back to Jerusalem. He's got a deadline. He's got to go. And uh, at this particular point, Luke, who writes uh, the book of Acts, is joined him. We know this because suddenly, if you're reading Acts, it starts speaking about not Paul, but we. So here's verse 6. We, which means Paul and Luke, we sailed from Philippi and joined the others at Troas, where we stayed seven days. So he's on his way to Jerusalem, and he stops at a town called Troas. Now he's in a rush, should keep moving. But suddenly it says that they stop for seven days. Uh, it suggests that he arrives on a Monday and he only re leaves the following Monday. Why does Paul, who's in a hurry, stop for seven days and sit around? It's not like he's got Wi-Fi, he can do stuff. He's just got to sit around. And the answer comes in the next verse. He doesn't want to miss the next church gathering that's going down the following Sunday in Troas. I'm going to show it to you. See, he prioritizes getting to that meeting, and he rearranges his travel plans. Now, now we're going to read the two verses that give us a glimpse into the first century gathering of the church, vintage church. Verse 7, on the first day of the week, so that's six days later, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, kept on talking until midnight. Sometimes preachers can preach long. <laughs> There were many lamps in the upstairs room where we were meeting. Okay, that's my text for today. I want to answer three questions. Where did they meet? When did they meet? And I want to spend most of my time answering the question, why did they meet? And when I get to that question, I'm going to jump to John chapter 20 just to confuse you. So here we go. Where did they meet? Well, we're told in verse 8 that they met in an upstairs room of someone's house. Why was the church of Troas... A meeting in our home? Well, a few simple reasons. One, Jesus uh, basically said to his disciples that there's no such thing as holy places. Every place is holy. You know, you know the Jews used to worship in the temple. Pagans used to worship in their pagan temples, and then along came the church, and they were not looking for a temple to meet in because they understood they were the temple. Also, uh, Christianity wasn't an official religion, so they're probably forbidden from using public spaces. They're also, also probably quite poor and couldn't afford public places. And besides, they were probably a small church, and they could squash into someone's home. There are some bigger churches mentioned in the Bible, Jerusalem, Antioch, Ephesus, where you could find some bigger spaces. Hey, there's some lessons here for us. We need to ask ourselves the question when looking for a venue, is there enough space? Is there enough space? And I like to think of the church, uh, the, the venue, not as a pot plant, but as a shoe. You plant a plant in a pot plant, and that pot plant will determine how big that plant can grow. But when you put a shoe on a five-year-old kid, you know that in a year's time, you've got to toss that shoe out. 
There is no such thing as a permanent venue, actually. There's a permanent, permanent church in a temporary venue. And uh, whenever you start feeling like your shoe's getting too small, it's time to toss that shoe out, get a bigger shoe. Or if this shoe isn't working, let's try another shoe. And Life Changes is on the adventure of finding the shoe for its many different uh, congregations. The other question is, do people feel at home? I mean, meeting in a home sent a message that we're family. And it's so important that we use our spaces and, and create a sense of homeliness and welcome. And then the other question is, is there good stewardship? We want to make sure that we're doing the best we can with what we have. Every church imagines having a, a better venue, but the, the venue that God has given you is the one that you've got to steward. And there's only one question God's asking you. Are you doing the best you can with what I've given you? Hey, next question. When did they meet? When did they meet? Well, Paul arrived in Troas on Monday morning, but had to wait for seven days to get everyone together. Why seven days? Well, verse 7 tells us that they met on the first day of the week. Okay, by the way, the first day of the week is not Monday. First day of the week is Sunday. And we're told in other places in the New Testament that the church was in the habit of meeting together on the first day of the week. 1 Corinthians 16 verses 1 to 2, if you want to check it out. Sure, they built relationships, shared meals, but every church said at least once a week we get all of us together. And they would gather on the first day of the week, which is interesting because the, the church initially was a, a Jewish uh, sect, so to speak. So you would have thought that they would have met on the Shabbat which is when the Jews met, and yet they chose to meet the day after. I mean, Jesus was Jewish after all. But do a word study in the New Testament of the first day of the week, and, uh, and you realize it all goes back to John chapter 20. So I want to do a quick jump with you to John chapter 20. I mean, John chapter 20 says, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb. The stone had been removed from the entrance on the first day day of the week. And there's the answer. The first day is the day Jesus rose from the dead. The book of Revelation would call the first day of the week the Lord's day. I mean, he's Lord of every day, but there's something about the first day of the week. But then the term first day of the week comes again as you read through John chapter 20. In verse 19, it says, on the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. He showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. I mean, he's just risen from the dead early that morning. And it's evening and he's introducing himself to them. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And, and then it carries on. We're told that now Thomas, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. See, the Bible takes note of a person who didn't arrive at church. Such a concerning thing. It needs to be mentioned. So the other disciples told them, hey, we've seen the Lord. I'm a surfer. Often you get to a surf spot and someone goes, you should have been here this morning. And that's what these disciples are saying to Thomas. You should have been in that meeting. But he said to them, unless I see the marks and put my finger where the nails were, I will not believe. But wait, we keep reading. And then it says, a week later. What's a week later? That's seven days. The next first day of the week. A week later, his disciples were in the house again. We don't know what happened between, but Jesus, they didn't meet Jesus for another six or seven days. Until a week later, they were in the house again. And now Thomas was with them. Okay, he's already missed out on one church service. Not again. That's the next Sunday. The doors were locked. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hand, stop doubting and believe. And bang, Thomas has the revelation and he says the famous words, my Lord and my God. So, so why did the church meet on the first day? Well, the one we already know, it's the day Jesus rose again from the dead. The church gathers on the first day to celebrate the resurrection power of the living Lord. But there's a second reason that we meet on the first day. It follows on from the pattern Jesus got started in those first two ever church gatherings. I'm going to say that again. It follows on from the pattern Jesus got started in those first ever two church gatherings. Vintage church. So there's two reasons. It's the day of resurrection. Revelation 1, like I said, calls it the Lord's Day. But when we meet on a Sunday... That's a vintage thing to do. 
do we have to meet on a Sunday? I mean, it's not a rule, it's a guideline. We've got friends who lead churches in the Emirates. It's not appropriate to meet on a Sunday, they meet on a Friday. But where you can, you meet on a Sunday. And then the question, why did they meet? And John chapter 20 gives us a load of amazing answers about what the vintage church is about. You see, if John 20 tells us about the first two ever Sunday church meetings, then every church gathering ever since honors those first two church meetings. As scholars tell us, that's what John is trying to get across by keep on mentioning the first day of the week and the next meeting, the first day of the week. So what I want to do, the rest of the message, is analyze those vintage meetings, those first two. Because they give us ideas about the purpose and the power of meeting together. So I've got a bunch of things that I notice as we analyze it. Number one, they all gathered. They all gathered. All the apostles except Thomas were at the first, and he missed out. <laughs> and then uh, the next time he was going to make sure that he wouldn't miss out. See, meetings, vintage meetings build community. Uh, by the way, I think I'm speaking to the choir here. Uh, you know, when I think of Life Changes Church, I think about it as a church of people that love to be together. Uh, I, I've done church for 20 years in the southern suburbs, and people on average arrive at church 10, 15 minutes late. I got here, you guys arrived half an hour early. I actually asked someone, what's going on? Why is everybody up? And he said, people love church. I'm like, of course. And he said, but I've been to church in southern suburbs. They're quite social there. I said, yes, they're social after the meeting, not before. <laughs> Vintage churches build community. And we get there. We all get there. That's God's plan. But then we notice also that Jesus presenced himself among them. Jesus presenced himself among them. Yeah. See, at first, uh, they were in this upper room. They were socializing. They were talking. They were aware of each other. But then suddenly they become aware of another who's standing in their midst. And in the first centuries of the church, historians tell us that gathered churches would call on the name of Jesus, uh, inviting his revealed presence. Oh, we understand that Jesus is already here, but we welcome him. We ask him to show himself, to speak. You see, when the church gathers we gather in his name. We call on his presence. And that's the second thing about vintage meetings. Vintage meetings sensitize us to Jesus' presence. I've got a lot of friends who've come to faith, myself included. And most of them come to faith when they hear the gospel message preached. But a lot of them will say, you know, it wasn't the message. It was I was in a room where there were a lot of Christians worshiping, talking about Jesus, and suddenly, Jesus was in the room. My brother, when I became a Christian, he wasn't a Christian, and uh, I tried to share my faith with him. He really wasn't interested. Prayed for him, prayed for him, prayed for him. One day, I come home, and there's a Bible next to his bed. And turns out he's come to faith, but he didn't want to give me the honor of saying it to me in case I thought I had something to do with it, you know. In his mind, he wanted to do the opposite of me. Now, he's, oh, he's really irritated that he might be going the same path. And uh, we lived in Seapoint. But he's met a girl who lives in Tableview. And uh, he's hanging out with her on Sunday, and she says, okay, now I'm going to church. Come. And he goes to church, and he finds Christ. And when I ask him, how did that happen? He said, well, I didn't believe in Jesus until I was in a room where Jesus was. And, and that's one of the reasons we invite our friends. Because there's something about being together, the presence of Jesus, that, that he introduces himself. Yes, we believe in the power of the gospel message. We want to tell our friends there's something about getting our friends who are far from faith into the room where Jesus is. And then the third thing we notice in this meeting is that Jesus affirms uh, the reconciling effects of his finished work on the cross. I'll say that again. Jesus affirms the reconciling effects of his finished work on the cross. He says, peace be with you. But he doesn't just say that. He holds out his pierced hands. See, every meeting... We remember the wounds that welcome us. We remember the wounds that accept us, that reconcile us to God. We're saved not because of the good things we've done and despite the bad things we've done. We're saved by grace alone. God takes our sins, puts it on Jesus, on the cross, punishes it there, and now we have peace with God. And that's one of the reasons that, that we so often have communion when we gather together. 
communion reminds us of the wounds of Jesus. It takes us back to the cross. The reason we have peace with with God is because of those nail-pierced hands. And that, by the way, is the reason in in Troas we told on the first day of the week we came together to break bread. We reenact the gospel. The broken bread speaks of Jesus' broken, beaten body on the cross. The red wine speaks about his spilt blood every time we take of it. We reaffirm the scandalous grace of God that takes us as sinners into his company. And then mind you, uh, we, we're not doing it right now, but that moment in the meeting where we say, hey, say hi to people around you. <laughs> uh, you. You might think, oh, that's just a friendly church. No, that, for thousands of years, the church has passed the peace. At a certain point, if you've got a traditional church, would you please pass the peace? And everybody else, peace be with you and also to you. And it sounds like it's just being friendly church, but actually what's happening here is it's, it's picking up on vintage church. Jesus, based on the wounds, says, peace be with you. So he reconciles us to God. But if we're all reconciled to God, guess what? That means we're reconciled to each other. So we pass the peace to each other. Of course, if there's a person who's new to church, what we're doing is we're saying, hey, you're welcome too. The wounds of Jesus, they welcome you too. So so meetings, especially the cross, vintage meetings, especially the cross, reconcile us to God and others. That's why we gather, the power of the meeting. But the fourth thing we notice in John 20 is that Jesus had something to say to them. He had something to say to them. In the first uh, meeting, he says, you know, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And he says, he says you've, you've been given the message of forgiveness. Spread it out into the world. See, Jesus motiv- he gives a motivating message in that first meeting. But in the second meeting, he speaks again, but now he's speaking to doubt. It's a challenging word. He says to Thomas, you have believed because you've seen, but, but blessed are those who've never seen and yet will believe. And notice in the first meeting, Jesus is speaking to the collective, but in the second meeting, he's going for the person, the individual. See, when we gather, we expect Christ to say something to us. Sometimes it's motivating. Sometimes it's challenging. Sometimes it's always collective, but sometimes in the middle of the collective, it's like Jesus has been reading my mail. One of the privileges of being a preacher is how often after a message, someone will come to you and say, who told you? Who told you? And in Acts chapter 20 at the church of Troas, we told that Paul spoke to the people. And you know that he was speaking the gospel. He was speaking the Bible to them. Paul, in fact, telling another church leader in 2 Timothy 4 would say, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction for the time will come when people will not put up with sound teaching instead to suit their own desires they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear there's so much interesting information in the world but so little of it is of ultimate importance and so much of the information in the world actually lures us to a false gospel It's something that promises to fill us, but it can't. Ultimately, it's nothing of substance, nothing that truly satisfies, nothing that can heal our deepest brokenness, nothing that can reunite us to God. I mean, when you think about these false gospels, all you need to do is stand in a queue at a till and just look at the different magazine covers. Every every magazine cover kind of usually will represent a, a false gospel that's really popular in that particular culture. I'm not saying it's not true, but it lures you into a world and says, this is the most important thing in life. So the financial male gospel says, if you could just have financial security. The Cosmo uh, gospel is one that promises that beauty, independence, and love will solve all your problems. The GQ gospel says, if you could have a six pack, a successful career, and a hot chick, you're home and away. The magazine that I'm looking at, Zigzag Gospel, says, you know, a surf trip to Indo with your best buddies is all you'll need. I mean, you might as well have gone to heaven. Sports Illustrated will say, you know, your team, whether it's Stormers or Protez or Manchester United or whatever, winning, that's what you need. Mail and Guardian says, you know, if this political party could come to power, that'll solve our problems. The Oprah Mag says, get in touch with the universe, the true you, the God within is all you need. Then there's the home and leisure gospel, the digital life gospel, Mark's favorite one, Farmer's Weekly. He just fantasizes of having more sheep, getting more wool from that sheep. 
I'm not saying these don't have truth, but you're understanding right away that they, are, they trivialize the universe that you live in. It's important, but it's not most important. How many of them speak to your need for Christ? How many of them speak about your need for salvation? How many of them teach you to live in the grain of God's moral universe? How many of them help you to find God, follow God, to have more spiritual joy and ministry fruitfulness in your life? You see, vintage meetings, especially the word in vintage meetings, and I'm quoting Paul here, correct, rebuke, encourage, and instruct us. They do it by showing us more of Jesus. See, in Life Changes, I've, I've followed many of your messages online, but keep on unpacking the multidimensional, multifaceted gospel. Make it clear in our minds, real in our hearts. Week after week, we gather to hear another dimension and facet of who Jesus is, what he did, what he promises, what he is doing, and why all of it matters to every single area of your life. And, and then the fifth thing we notice in this meeting is Jesus sent them out in the Spirit's power to do mission in the world. Did you notice in both meetings, we're told that the doors were locked. Common Ground Church in Rondebosch bought the venue from a, a, a kind of a sectarian church, and it was a church that had its own oxygen tanks because it didn't want to breathe in the world's polluted air. And you couldn't come in. The doors were locked. There's a big gla looking glass that you could see to make sure that you're going to only let a member in. You don't want to let a, sh like a goat into the, the church venue. And these disciples think that that's the way they're going to go. Lock the doors. And of course, Jesus busts them out here. He says, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. He breathes the Spirit on them. I remember going to a church that as you walk out, there's a big sign saying, you are now entering the mission field. <laughs> and there's something about being together that catapults us out into the world with power and confidence. Everybody in the world would like a sense of mission and purpose. You know where you find it? by interacting with a mission God, a purpose-giving God. See, meetings, vintage meetings, especially the Spirit, they commission us. And when you feel like your life is a little bit aimless, <laughs> I know what can solve your problem, get to a vintage meeting. And then the last thing that I notice in these two church gatherings, the first two vintage ones, is climactically, they worshipped Jesus. They worshipped Jesus. I mean, you heard the words coming from Thomas's mouth. My Lord and my God is a revelation. Jesus is fully human, but he's no ordinary human. He's God in the flesh. And ever since churches have gathered to call in the name of Jesus and give him praise and 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 give him the praise that is his due. You see, see, they met with each other so as to meet with Jesus. When you forget that that's what church gathering is, you, for, you get, forget the most important thing. Yes, we gather together because we're gathering around Jesus. And they met with each other to put Jesus first. I, I don't know what calendar you use. But most calendars will do Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Have you, have you seen that? And it's a bit irritating when you're planning a weekend. You're like, oh, I've got to go to a new row here. But those calendars are being true to the fact that Sunday is not the last day of the week. It's the first day of the week. You see, in the Shabbat, Shabbat was the last day of the week. So that was the special day where you recovered from your week. Whew, got to the end. Let's rest. And Jesus says, no, 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 I don't want anyone to think of church as the last thing you do in the work. I want you to think about church as the first thing you do in the week. You go into that week in resurrection power. You go to exclusive bookshops. There's so many self-help books that speak about starting things well. You get five, five or six bestsellers. How to start your day well. There's not enough books about how to start your week well. But I tell you, Vintage Church teaches us the best way to start your week is with the people of God in the presence of Jesus. You see, meetings reboot us. That's one of the things I love about church gatherings. After a week of strain, or maybe some failure on our part, we get to reboot, start again. The first day of the week comes and we gather with Jesus' people. He presences himself with us. He reaffirms his grace and peace toward us but based on the cross. He speaks to us. He sends us out in mission into the world in the Spirit's power. And we get to tell him again how much we love him. How often, if you're a follower of Jesus, does your walk with God need to be rebooted? I'll tell you how often Jesus thinks. Once every seven days. 
once every seven days. You see, that's vintage church. <laughs>